Apologies, those of you that have been to IFG events before will know that normally this is a picture of calm, competence, brilliant organization. Um, we have had a text to the President of Mexico saying he was slightly surprised so many women wanted to turn out <laughs> and see his parade down the mall. Um, and sorry, that is partly the occupational hazard of, uh, of our location. So sorry for our slightly inadequate risk management around that, but it's really good to have all of you here. And absolutely delighted that finally our panellists have made it through the obstacle course we uh, set them. And so I'm really delighted to announce, uh, to introduce our three mentors today. So on my immediate left, we have Margaret Mountford, uh, who certainly I think is a um, fantastic role model. I think The Apprentice hasn't been the same since, uh, <coughs> since she left. But anyway, she's a former lawyer, a corporate finance partner in Herbert Smith now has a wide range of non-executive directorships, chairs the Argent Group Europe, and is also, uh, I think, chair of the Bright Ideas Trust, a charity which helps young people start their own businesses. And she's also I think, on the board or chairs two schools. Anyway, so uh, she's also a member of the advisory board of Westminster Business School. And was actually only on The Apprentice for five series, which I find very hard to believe. But anyway, we're it absolutely seemed like a lifetime. I'm <laughs> sure it seemed like a lifetime. We're absolutely delighted to have Margaret here with us. And then on my slightly further left, we have Claire Moriarty. Um, although she's DG Rail, we probably can't blame her for the holdups uh, in getting here today. So Claire will take your rail questions outside. Um, but the reason that we've asked Claire here is when I was asking people who they would uh, recommend. Uh, one of the people I'd emailed asking, actually, if someone else had a recommendation, she said, well, Claire Moriarty's my mentor, and she's really good. Mm -hmm. So we thought that was a very good personal recommendation. So Claire has a particular interest in mentoring, and mentors both civil service colleagues, but also is a mentor for the Women in Rail group. I would have thought that's about two people, but anyway, <laughs> but we'll find more out about the Women in Rail group. And then finally, and probably most affected by the uh, trying circumstances today, is Panina Thompson, who is Chief Executive of the Mentoring Foundation. She's got a massive career. I suggest you Google her and find out exactly everything she's done. Uh, she manages the FTSE 100 Cross Company Mentoring Program. She's also published four books and uh, numbers of articles on all this and was awarded an OBE for service to women and equality in the Queen's Jubilee Honours, which, in case you weren't paying attention, was in 2012, which was probably the last time we had disruptions on this scale. Now, we're not going to have intros from the panel, uh, or whatever. We're going to draw on questions. Now, we asked some people to post questions in advance uh, to mentors at instituteforgovernment.org.uk. If you want to tweet, there's everything there. Um, but obviously, with the travel obstacles, it's quite likely that the people who said they wanted to come and ask questions have probably not made it through. But just for starters, she said it's very high risk, is Sarah Hickey here? No. Anyway, I'm going to ask one of Sarah's questions for a starter then. Uh, Sarah actually posted five questions, uh, which did set the record. Um, but I'm going to ask a, a question for a start. One of Sarah's questions is, do you think women should seek out female mentors, as they may have faced similar work-related decisions, or male mentors, as they are still overrepresented in senior management? Or doesn't it matter? Any thoughts on that? Margaret. Well, I don't think it matters. I think you want to find the right person for you and the right person uh, for... Sorry, I'm reaching the end of a code. I'm not much And the right person for, for, what, I've got more for, what, for what you do. And it doesn't have to be a woman and it doesn't have to be a man and it doesn't have to be just one person either. I don't think one needs to have the... It, it, it can be beneficial, but I think you, you, you may want to talk some things over with one type of person and other things over with another type of person. And, and, and I think it's, it's, it's wrong to think of it, particularly wrong to think of it in, in terms of gender stereotypes. Claire? Um, I think I would say both, because I absolutely agree with Margaret. I think um, <coughs> I'm a great believer in having a div you know, quite a variety of, of uh, different people as mentors and different types of mentoring relationships. I think the, there are sorts of conversations that you will have with, uh, with female mentors because they will have a direct <coughs> understanding of some of the issues, whether they're issues about you know, kind of families and caring or issues about, you know, some of the, the more fundamental gender issues, you can have those discussions with a woman who will understand them directly in a way that you can't have them with a man. A man. But there are all sorts of other conversations that you can have with a man more helpfully because they will be able to give you 
a different perspective. So I would say, firstly, uh, you know, absolutely don't confine yourself. I, I also, um, I talk about big M mentoring, small M mentoring. So big M mentoring is sort of, you know, proper mentoring where you have a relationship with somebody over a period of time and you might meet them once every six weeks or so and have an hour and sort of do that in a quite a structured way. And small M mentoring is uh, more informal, more opportunistic, you know, you get in touch with somebody, you say, can I have a coffee? Uh, you have a conversation with them, you can then go back to them and ask them specific questions. It doesn't, ha not, not all forms of mentoring need to be, you know, proper and structured. It's good to have some of that, but actually the more, uh, the more kind of free with mentoring you can be, both as a mentee and I'd say as a mentor, the more people <coughs> get to benefit from both sides of the relationship. Panina. Uh, the risk of saying I agree, <laughs> I agree with all that. Um, <coughs> I found, excuse me. <coughs> I found it helpful to think of having one's own personal board of advisors. You know, who is on one's board, and you have you know, for the board for you as an individual, and you wouldn't want to have just one type of person or indeed one gender on, on your own board. So I agree with what both Margaret and Claire have said that it's um, hugely beneficial to get a variety of and a different texture of opinions when, when people are advising you or, or helping you think things through. I do think, though, that at particular phases, as Claire's just said, at particular phases of their lives, women in particular um, are more ready to share information um, and to um, be vulnerable, if you like, with another woman, particularly when they're talking about issues connected with the timing and. Um, issues connected with juggling family life. They, they, they find that, in my experience, slightly more complicated, raising that with a man. So I think there may be phases of a woman's life when she might benefit more from having a female mentor. But in general, absolutely with my colleagues on the panel, uh, spread, spread this task. So another question for one of our other uh, recipients is, as, if you're approached by someone who wants you as a mentor, but you just don't really want to mentor them. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I just wonder, what's your selection criteria? Is this person worth my time and effort, whatever, and how you cope with, uh, cope with that? Maybe we'll go back to Panina again. Okay. Panina. Okay. Um, well, I'm a big believer in truthfulness. Um, I get asked by a huge number of people because of the work I do, because of the FTSE program and the Mentoring Foundation. Uh, whether I would be their mentor, and it's just not, or well, two, two issues. First of all, it's just not possible to say yes to everybody. And secondly, it's a slightly invidious situation. You know, if you've got, we've got 120 women that, um, you know, are mentees and alumni, and, you know, you can work with some and not with others, and how do you choose? It's too difficult. So I believe in being frank and saying, well, no, I can't help, but I tell you a couple of people you might want to have a chat with and then try and refer them on. I try to refer on. But not as hospital passes. Not as hospital passes, no. no. I, I think that's um, a, a very good way of destroying one's, the quality of one's network. <laughs> if, if somebody um, is uh, having a discussion with you and you realize pretty rapidly there's some really major issues here that might be more amenable to therapy, for example, <laughs> it is not a friendly act to pass that person on to a colleague who, or, or uh, you know, another mentor. So Margaret, you were, qu you were quite well known for your slightly no-nonsense approach to people who, admittedly it was reality TV, but appeared to be complete <coughs> no-hopers. So if somebody comes to you and you really think this person has, you know, is actually lucky to have reached the grade they've got or the position they've got and really has not much potential, you know, what do you do with them? Well, possibly my reputation for, uh, which you just described, because nobody ever comes and asks me to be there. <laughs> so <laughs> so, so I've, I've escaped that one. But I mean, I do get asked, you know, people pitch up with their CVs, say, could you just have a look at this? Could you? And I get a lot of sort of one off requests as opposed to anybody daring to, 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 nobody would ever want to have a long term mentor mentee relationship with me. But, um, and, and sometimes one can, you know, help a bit, or you suggest somebody else that, 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 that might be more appropriate, or, or just a quick, a quick coffee, you know, which, which is a sort of one-off thing and a, and a pointing towards, towards something else. But I, I, I genuinely would not have time to take on a, a, a long-term mentor-mentee mm -hmm. relationship. I think, I mean, I, th I think it, it very much depends whether you're talking about, as in, in my terms, a big M mentoring and a sm or a small M. I mean, small M, 
uh, you ha having a cup of coffee with somebody, having a conversation, doing a sort of, you know, what's the conversation, what's the sort of short con coaching conversation you can have? You know, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't put any criteria around that. I think in order to have a longer term relationship, you've got to, you know, you've got to want to do it. It's n it doesn't help either party if when you see it popping up in your diary, you think, oh my God, have I got to do that again? <laughs> so there's got to be the chemistry there. But that's why most, uh, you know, most schemes that uh, match mentors with mentees actually have got the concept of a chemistry meeting. Mm -hmm. So you do say, well, if I look at this person's you know, CV and what they're interested in and this, what this person's experience is, I think they might make a good mentee, uh, mentoring relationship. But before we go nap on it, you know, let's have that uh, you know, f uh, you know, impact uncommitted on both sides, meeting, see how you get on. And some, you know, different people get on with different people. There'll be some, somebody you talk to and he will immediately click. And then there'll be somebody else who you think, well, that's very interesting, but I'm not sure that they're going to be able to help me that much. So actually having that uh, opportunity to take stock on both sides before you commit is really worthwhile. Okay, now let's open it up. I've got some more questions here that were posted anonymously uh, or not anonymously. But anyone want to sort of join the conversation, either to comment on these or to ask a question? Yes, there. If you, can, if you want to tell us who you are, tell us who you are. Hi, I'm Sam Dowling. I'm the uh, comms director for a membership body representing GPs. But I've previously been uh, a member of staff in but not of a number of sectors, including the civil service, and worked as a journalist. And so my question is about transient workers like myself who may spend a year, two years in an organization and move on. Um, I welcome the concept of mentoring, but question how, if you're outside a, an environment that formally supports it as part of your career structure, so the civil service, it's also very commonly found in the third sector, for those of us working in the private sector and jumping from one area to another without the formalized links, how would you suggest we access <coughs> mentoring? And um, the question about busy people, the more senior you become, it becomes very challenging to be able to approach people to provide support mm. without maybe undermining or being perceived mm. to undermine your professionalism. So two questions, I think, but um, I'd be really interested in your responses. Panina, I think that's a nice one for you to pick up about. You know. can, I, can I start with the, your, the first of your two points? You know, as, I, as I understand it, what you're saying is that some individuals are uh, leading a more portfolio life, jumping between particular activities, so how to access somebody who's outside a given framework. Um, I think it kind of links back to something Claire said earlier, you, it, back to your big M and little M mentoring, isn't it? I, I think if you go, as I'm sure you do, to lots of talks and events and seminars and somebody starts to speak in a way that you think, I could learn from that person, then I'm a great believer in seizing the moment and asking. The very worst that can happen is that you can be rejected. And you know, if you've got a reasonably healthy ego, then you're not going to be devastated by that. And if you couch it lightly, you know, would it be possible for me to have, a, as, you, as Claire says, a cup of coffee with you or a quick 10-minute chat? Most people will say yes. So be opportunistic and be willing to be in, and my second recommendation is look for the people that inspire you. If you go to something and somebody speaks in such a way that you think, God, I could really learn from him or her, then, then act on that and approach them in, in, a, in an understanding and non-demanding way and see what happens. I'm afraid you had to remind me of the second part of your question. So that was the first part. Um, it's similar but different. So as you, be loud here, but um, as you progress through your career, um, revealing some insecurity about myself, possibly, but it, there is sometimes that question of if you're asking questions that, um, that you would like some assistance with, you're seeking counsel, mm. it's sometimes quite tough to know until you've done the sounding whether they're the obvious questions or not. And that comes back to having a structured, mm. rather than an informal process, the informality of approaching someone can sometimes make you feel a little wrong-footed. So I suppose it's just really, are there any suggestions about forums to explore mentoring beyond the ad hoc approach? Beyond the ad hoc approach. Um, well, if you belong to um, professional bodies or if you belong to you know, something like City Women Network or, or, or its equivalent, there are so many networks now, then that might provide a kind of surrogate structure for the organisational, um, professional related structure that, that um, people in organisations can benefit from. Um, 
I suppose I'm pretty intuitive in my approach, really. You know, I, 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 I just keep my antenna. Well, if I look back to my career, what's happened with me is I've, uh, I just known when I've actually wanted to benefit from somebody's wisdom, experience, advice, wise counsel, hints and tips, you know, sort of avoid this, go for that, and I've approached them uh, wherever I've found them, actually, both within the organisation and referring back to an earlier question and out with it, you know, in other, in other um, thinking about one's personal board is very helpful. Who do you want on your personal board? A variety of people, some within the structure, some deliberately outside the structure. And, and follow your instincts, you know, f f follow where you're, you're, where you're, if you're intrigued by a human being and want to learn from I, I've actually approached, there's a chap called Donald Trelford who used to be deputy editor of The Observer when I was a sprog, when I was about 23. He, he wrote a very interesting piece in The Observer. I can't remember what it was about, but it moved me and I thought it was wonderful. So I wrote him a letter and told him how his letter had affected me. He invited, I lived in Hi, welcome. And he invited me to have a coffee in London. Uh, now, that may not sound a big deal to us all sitting here in the centre of London, but when I was 21, 22, and living in High Wycombe, it was a big deal. And I met the deputy editor of the Observer, and a whole lot of things flowed from that. So I'm a big believer in following one's instincts mm. and acting on them. So that relates to another question we actually had posted earlier, which is about, um, it sounds like picking up people. But anyway, um, maybe Carol Margaret, do you have any tips for how to meet people and make lasting contacts at work events with big groups where you don't know anyone? <coughs> Two little shy retiring wallflowers here. So what's your, <laughs> what's your approach for uh, making contacts at work events? Do you hand out your card or...? I have to say, I'm not good at this. Um, I think it's a difficult thing to do. Some people have, you know, buckets of confidence and are very happy to walk into large gatherings full of entirely and unknown people and hand out their business card. I can't do that. Um, I think, I mean, I'm much more in, in, the, in the sort of space that uh, Polina's talking about, where if there is, if somebody has said something that, you know, really does, where I, where, where I can genuinely and authentically say that really meant something to me, it really made me think about something else, I can make a connection to something I've done in, in another area, I'm quite happy to initiate a conversation on that basis and if I pluck up my courage a bit then to say, the, and could I have a, com could I have a, come and have a, you know, a conversation with you. So I think that, you know, it's the, it's rather than trying to do something huge and flamboyant, you now what's the small step that you feel able to take that builds on the space you feel comfortable with um, and you know so do one thing don't try to walk into a, a, a room and you know have everybody falling about going here's the person I must see but find if, if there's one person if you can make one mm. sort of properly personal connection a properly grounded connection with one person and find one way of following it up one of the things that really good mentors do in my experience and I always try to do it for people is to make the next set of connections so if, if somebody does the can I have a cup of coffee, coffee with you thing to me I say yes very happy to and I'll have a cup of coffee I'll try and tease out a bit about who they are what they want what it was that mm. made them think they might have a, want to have mm. a conversation by the time I'm halfway through that conversation I will have some clues about things that they're interested in or you know, the places they might want to work and I will be ticking over in my mental Rolodex about who might it be useful for this person to talk to next and normally I will finish those conversations having promised uh, to contact one or two other people and say could this person come and have a conversation with you. So it's, the, you know, it's, that, it's that way, it's, it's making connections through a sort of series of small steps rather than trying to do something in a huge big bang. Margaret, any? I used to hate this in the city, you used to go into those rooms full of people and you used to think, I'm the only person here who doesn't know anybody. It, you can always look around and find someone who's standing on their own and go to them and they'll probably be terribly pleased to talk to you. <laughs> and then it will, just, it will just grow. The other way to do it is to go on something like The Apprentice because then people say, oh, well, you're on The Apprentice. <laughs> but they are you normally the sort of people you don't want to talk to. So that, that, that doesn't, you know, hasn't, hasn't been successful. But I think if you can just have a, any of these events which can be terrifying you know if you have a really good conversation with with one person and and just on Penina's point on on you know who would you like to have on your personal board which I think is, is a great analogy are you on that board 
because, or are you being governed by that board? Because I think one can get an awful lot of benefit by chatting things over with someone who is your contemporary, your equivalent, at your level, whatever the appropriate term is, or a friend who isn't in that business, but just a you know, mate that you don't mind unbearing your soul in front of, who will say, no, I really think it'd be crazy if you did that. You know, do, so, you know, so you, you, I think, you know, are you on the level with this board, or are you thinking of yourself as below it, asking a whole lot of terribly senior people, you know, for directions? Yeah, Can I build on that? really, really important point. Uh, and I, I just want to say a couple of words about the c concept of reciprocity. Because for, for me, in all the sort of relationships um, that are being described, one of the key criteria or indicators of authenticity, lose Claire's word, is people's willingness to throw the ball back. You know, it's, it's not, I am very chary about people who just want to take from you. Because w when you're in a position of any sort of authority and seniority, there are some people who sort of just all want a bit of you. And you can get very depleted by just people taking from you the whole time. What is more wonderful is when you work with somebody or talk with somebody and they say, that's been incredibly helpful. I wonder if it would be helpful to you if. And then you have a kind of spirit of exchange, reciprocity, that is much more, coming to Margaret's point, much more equal a meeting of peers, a connection of peers, rather than uh, a hierarchy being established. So I think that's really important too. So that slightly links to one of the other questions we had. I think we had Simon Fraser here, who, for those of you who are civil servants, he's the diverse, the slightly implausible, no, very excellent diversity champion for the civil service, uh, Prime Secretary at the Foreign Office. And he was talking about upward mentoring, mm. to basically to help the more senior staff understand what they didn't quite get about the sort of perspectives of their more junior staff, more junior women, not overrepresented necessarily in the top ranks of the Foreign Office. I wonder if any of you thought upward mentoring was a good idea or a bit of a gimmick or whatever. Claire, do you do upward mentoring in DFT? We don't, though I did. I did try to persuade uh, the Cabinet Office to give me that there's a, there's a thing called the Top 200, which is a meeting uh, about twice a year of all of the Director Generals and Permanent Secretaries. Um, and uh, I was working with a group of people, which came actually out of an event we ran uh, here at the Institute, who were, that we were called the change enthusiasts, or people who actually wanted to do things differently, and they came up with these fantastic ideas, and I tried to persuade the Cabinet Office to give me a whole of a top 200 day, so that we could do loads of things like, you know, upward mentoring, and people sitting, you know, getting people who really understand digital stuff because they are young and it comes naturally <laughs> to them. To sit alongside people who these things don't come quite so naturally. Bring your IT problem here. Uh, yes. And sadly, uh, it wasn't, I wasn't quite persuasive enough. I didn't manage to get, it, get, uh, get that. But I think, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't myself do it formally. Um, I do, there are certain people who I know around my organisation mm. who I know that with the right encouragement, they will come and tell me exactly what they think. <laughs> Uh, and they're incredibly valuable. I, I do think actually formalising it will be mm. quite a it will be quite a smart thing to do because if if it's if it's dependent on people feeling that they've been given permission, mm. then you will get certain personality types who feel very happy doing that, and other people who don't, and you don't necessarily hear all of the, the voices. Um, I haven't done it yet, but uh, I might go back and give it a try. Mm. Any any thoughts, Paul? Well, there are formal um, ways of doing it, aren't there? There are. You know, like schools of student councils, and there's there's mm. there's you know councils who, who put forward the view. So it's not so much standing on your own saying I think it's it's you know we think or I you know that I'm in my official role as as you know representative of of my group of people. This is what what we'd like to say. And then there's those 360 degree appraisals or whatever they is. Is that the correct term? Mm. Where where it, it 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 works both ways. I think it's terribly good to have a to have that sort of a. a an approach because because otherwise you you can get isolated as you get more senior from and, and you forget what it's like and maybe you are making unreasonable demands or it's not or what seems totally clear to you is is completely opaque to people who haven't been there for for 20 years that sort of thing so you you, you can formalize these things in sort of groupings which means you're not quite so exposed Okay, we'll sign up for Claire's Top 200 Day. Those of you that are civil servants, it sounds like quite a bunch of fun. So let's go, uh, let's go back to the audience again and ask some more questions. Um, go Lady in Pink, Lauren. Thank you. 
at Daisy Seven Fabian Society. Uh, forgive me if this is a slightly uh, naive question, but I've just started at Fabian's a few months ago, and a lot of people have been talking to me about the importance of mentoring and finding a mentor and someone to direct me in my career, whatever it might be. Um, I'm wondering what should what does a good mentoring relationship look like for the mentee? What should you reasonably expect from th that? Um, and also, what does a bad uh, mentoring relationship look like so that I can look out for it? Marla, Thank you. what's a good relationship look like or a bad relationship? I think it's probably easier to say what a bad one is because you don't want somebody telling you what to do all the time. And you don't want somebody just listening to you and, and sort of agreeing with you all the time either. So you want a bit of critical friend, reasonable challenge sort of thing. But the, the, the chemistry point that... that that Claire made is, is terribly important. You've got to get on with the person, you know, because they, they won't really see things your way unless you can get on with them. And, and they need, I think, the mentor and mentee need to be able to see things the same. Certainly, the mentor needs to see where the mentee is is coming from and understanding that, and then seeing in in the broader sense, well, is that the right way to approach this, or what are the obvious next steps, or or is this actually completely the wrong place? And the, but the mentoring that I see through the, the Bright Ideas Trust, which is, is very different from this sort of level, and that there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's a big difference between someone who's just starting out in the business on their own, which is what we have, getting help from somebody who's actually been there and, and done it, and helps them avoid the, the pitfalls and having to reinvent the wheel all the time. And that's completely different from the sort of higher level executive mentoring of, of, of other executives and so on. So I think, I think we, we use the term mentoring, but it actually covers a whole range, doesn't it? So any other thoughts on good or bad? Good um, or bad? I can't, I can't speak about bad, um, but I can throw out a couple of thoughts mm. about characteristics of, um, or some things that help in, re in regard to our mentoring programmes. And one of the things, I'll just mention one thing, is that we ask each incoming mentee uh, to provide us not only when they've been nominated by their chairman, not only to provide us with their CV, which is the story of the past, of course, but also to write a single page of A4 that is their personal statement. Um, one of the chairmen suggested this, and it was an excellent idea. I can claim no credit for it. He suggested this, and he said, well, get each incoming mentee to write a single page of A4 on which she... Um, divided into three equal components. The first third of the page should be on why I want to be on the FTSE 100 cross-company mentoring programme, because it's not adequate simply to be nominated for it, to say, well, I've been nominated, that's why I'm here. Not good enough. What it, we need to understand her intent. What is her intent? Why does she want to be on this? Why is she doing it? Second third of the page is what do I hope to get out of it? He said we all accept that during the course of a year's mentoring or two years mentoring, that's likely to change. It's not going to be writ in stone. But I think it would be good for each incoming person to reflect on uh, what her uh, hopes were for the actual process right at the start. And then the last third of the page is, and given the above, how do I suggest that we cut into the conversations? Because that will help the mentor think, OK, this is why she's here. This is what she roughly hopes to get out of it. And here's how we're going to start the conversation. And it means they can get off to a good trajectory, good flying start, and make good use of the time available. Mm -hmm. So that's the thought about success. I, I think that's, yeah. that's what I would just go back to Margaret's point. I think, I think mentoring does look very different at different stages of people's careers. And I would say that you know, if you're at a relatively early stage, so you've found yourself in an organisation, you've got a boss who's telling you what to do, and he'll be doing some of the types of things that you're the kind of entrepreneur mentors doing the sort of how do you, you know, with experience, how do I do the work well? What you would ideally want in a mentor is somebody who can help you think through the how do I find out what I'm good at? How do I find out what I enjoy? How do I think about what I might want to do next? You know, and, and for women, there is often a moment when you're thinking, how do I understand how I might want to juggle um, you know, family responsibilities? Uh, do I want to climb as far up the career ladder as I can to be there and then if I need to take some time out I'm there already, do I want to pace myself, do I want to stay in a sector, How do so you want, you're looking for somebody who's got the, the time to have that, those conversations with you and actually can help you structure some of that, so you probably want a, a, a mentor who can kind of help you work through some of those things towards a, you know, at the end of six months, do you have a better idea of what you're really good at, where you can make yourself even better, what you need, you know, 
places you might want to go, places you might not want to go. That's quite a different sort of mentoring than some of the things you might want at a later stage. But I think it, at your stage, that's the kind of thing I'd be looking for. Lauren, this question here. Gentleman in the front row. Hiya. Um, my name is Jordan Hatch. I work for the Cabinet Office. Um, my question is, how does one sort of overcome that kind of um, imposter syndrome or that inferiority complex when you're talking with somebody who's offering you a lot of time but is someone you respect a lot and you, and you feel almost as if they're a bit out of your league and you, and you don't just sort of sit there sort of jabbering on with rubbish for like an hour? <laughs> <laughs> Margaret. <coughs> um, I think you just have to... Say, well, no, actually, if they're talking to me and they're happy to do it, I'm going to take as much advantage of it of it as I can, have more, and, and think that they were probably in the same position. And, and um, you know, that, that's, I mean, ima you can imagine them in some silly situation, I suppose, yeah. we want to try and yeah. make it feel, you know, but, but, but th they, unless they keep looking at their watch all the time, <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're probably getting something out of it too, so, so don't worry about that. Any other tips for overcoming imposter syndrome? Um, you might tr no, you personally, one might try um, just reminding oneself that uh, but the fact that you're sitting there doing that job means that you're good. I think a lot of, um, I'm less experienced with um, mentoring men than I am with women, but I was an executive coach for both men and women 14 years, so here I'm thinking about my coaching background rather than the mentoring background. And one of the things that I've noticed is that some of the very best people uh, of both sexes them have a very unclear idea of just how good they are and quite a lot of my um, conversations with them was to say just, just, just remember you're very good and you can see somebody sort of just kind of expand into their chair when they're given a little bit of positive feedback in that way so don't forget how good you are you won't be jabbering on <laughs> you'd have thought about the uh, meeting before you went into it you wouldn't have just gone into it cold you'd have been thinking about the previous evening you know, just think about, you know, if I get a chance, I'm going to raise two points and I'd like him or her to talk to me about X. Go in with it, it, as loose a framework of that as that. That will that'll serve you well. And I think the other thing is a good mentor would lift that anxiety from you mm -hmm. because, you know, you know that somebody's going to be worrying about that a bit. I mean, one of the things that I always try to do is to, is to share the, you know, you know, we were all there once. You know, we don't spring fully forward into <laughs> straight to the general. Uh, and th those, just that sense of, you know, Part of what a mentor can do is to, you know, give the encouragement that everybody goes through this phase, and you know you can come out the other side. So I would hope that while you might go into a, a meeting feeling that you might have that worry, that actually with a you know with a, a, a good mentor you would uh, you would lose it quite quickly. Okay, at the back, Jane. Hi, I'm Jane Dudman uh, from The Guardian, from The Guardian Public Leaders Network. So the emphasis so far has been very much and quite rightly on making a connection with a mentor. What about the grit in the oyster? What about the person who actually makes you feel uncomfortable, but actually you learn a lot from? Um, is that relevant to mentoring? Uh, what, what, wh who's the person that you've learned most from that actually you didn't immediately connect with? Right, so that's as a mentor or <laughs> as a mentee. So either side of the relationship, where have you actually learned a lot from a sort of not just nice cups of coffee with nice people. Panina. <laughs> All right. um, it's not, I, mean, I don't think mentoring is a cosy chat necessarily. Um, I mean, it, it, both parties are investing time, it, which is the most precious commodity mm. I, into this exchange. Mm. Um, a, and it's not just a cosy chat. And any mentor worth their salt is going to uh, ensure that, you know, to use crude term, there's value for money for both parties in this. There's got to be value added for, for both parties. Mentors won't mentor if they're not convinced of the calibre and, um, you know, the, the person sitting opposite them is of a calibre and of an orientation, is minded to try and get the benefit, if you like. And equally, a mentee, uh, any work mentee worth his or her salt is, is, is going to seek to get the most out of the exchange. So frankness and you know, constructive challenge, um, calling things how they are, you know, calling people on things. You know, but this, this is a, not a cosy chat. Mentoring should not be, it's a waste of everybody's time, it's just a cosy chat. You, skilled mentors temper 
their, their contribution according to the perceived um, strengths and weaknesses, experience level and age of the person they're sitting opposite. Anybody who's good at mm. it will be calibrating quite finely all the time while they're getting to know somebody. People who are less experienced in mentoring are quite naturally not usually quite as good as that. So if you get a really good mentor who can do that calibration, then hold on to them. But it's not, it's, in my experience, it's not a cosy chat. I'm not clear whether I'm being asked whether I can draw on my personal experience for a grit in the oyster mm -hmm. instance. Is that, is that what you're asking? Uh, so something that's been tough, and um, quite a lot of them, actually. Um, I'll tell you one that's perhaps slightly less anticipated, and it's not in a business context. When I was doing a DPhil at Oxford, and uh, it wasn't going fabulously well. It was about £8,000 in debt. This is many years ago, and now it would be sort of £50,000 in debt, but I was say about £8,000 in debt. Um, I'd used my NATO pension to fund this DPhil, you know, coming back as a mature student. I was 38, and I'd taken a bit of a wrong turn, I think, in retrospect, you know, because I, I'd given up extremely good job, tax-free salary, salary, flat in Paris, all those good things, to explore the theme of civil war and some English and French drama between 1572 and 1614, <laughs> which seemed like a great idea at the time, uh, and I don't regret it, but I had just realised that when the government talked about new blood for the universities, actually they didn't mean people who are 38, they meant people who are 26. And this light had dawned. I was a bit slow on the uptake. And you know, you don't give up a DPhil at Oxford or Cambridge easily. And I was absolutely agonising about this. What on earth to do? How quickly could I finish it? How much debt should I take on? And I went to talk, I won't name him, I went to talk to not the head of my college, but the head of another college. And I faffed around, I really did jabber, I faffed around trying to get the words out that I thought I'd taken a wrong turn and what the hell should I do about it? And he said, I'm going to pour you a glass of sherry. They did that in those mm. days. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pour you a glass of sherry and then you're going to tell me what the problem really is, which really made me wriggle. Mm. And he came back with said glass and he said, now, what's really going on? And I said, I think I need to stop doing this defil. And I you know, uh, had a good, jolly good cry. And he said, you know what? You can stop doing this. It's perfectly all right. So that was a very tough discussion mm. for me. But he... He helped me focus on what I really wanted. He forced me to get the words out. You know, I've taken a wrong turn. It's a cul-de-sac. It was a mistake. Everyone told me it was going to be, uh, and I was wrong, and they were right. And then he sort of dusted me down psychologically, and I said, okay, now go away, and in three weeks' time, come back with a couple of good ideas about what you might do next. How good is that? So that was, but that was tough. I went out, you know, pretty, pretty pink cheeks and eyes, mm -hmm. eyes streaming. So Claire, Bar Margaret, can you trump <laughs> Panina's story <laughs> until the end of the oh, PhD is definitely <laughs> finished. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not, but I think it's a it's a really good question. And I was uh, as Felina was talking, I was just thinking if I think around my my personal board, I think and the Felina's analogy of having your own board is absolutely spot on. As as, as you get, you know, in more senior levels, it very much is that they're you know, and they're people. Sort of going to your point about how do you find mentors in a transient life? They're people I have come across at some stage, and who I I both both of us have valued the conversations enough to keep having them. Now, several of them are people who say things that make me feel quite uncomfortable. So they either, you know, sometimes they will tell me I should do things that I don't want to do, mm. which I don't find easy. Or in some cases they just create an environment where I realise that maybe what I'm doing isn't, isn't quite the right thing and they, you know, they if, you know, force me to challenge. Mm. In the moment, I will often think, oh, you know, they're wrong. How can they possibly be saying that? But I think the measure of the value is when I go away and a day or so later, I'm thinking, mm, yes, I might not agree with what they said, but it's making me think in a different way from where I was before. And I think it's, it's, that's, that's a hugely important point. So if you, if you feel, you know, if you feel cross in a mentoring conversation, that's a gift in a sense, but sometimes you have to take away and process it over time. Margaret, have you had any experience of... Not really. I can think of, of examples where I've learned, because I was a lawyer in private practice for 25 years, and I would see the way somebody handled a client or handled a difficult situation, and I'd think, yeah, that's what I want to do, or I could see, gosh, I made a real mess of that thing I've just done compared to the way this person has handled something. Mean, that wasn't in a, in a mentor-mentee relationship. I never felt the need to have a mentor in relation to my own career and where I was going. When I did law for 25 years, I decided to stop. I handed in my notice. I didn't talk to anybody else about whether that was the right decision or not. I didn't feel I needed to. Um, I, I can see that, that 
some people do need that. And I think what I've had is, is a bunch of different role models in for different aspects, um, but not necessarily the, the, the formal discussion. Um, that would be if I needed it with, with friends, probably, rather than in the work context. But, and and so, so I can't think of a, a particular time when, when, apart from, as I said, examples, when I, I can see that I could have handled something much better and I've tried to learn from that. One thing I did learn was that if you think you've made a mistake, jolly well go and own up about it straight away, because the sooner you've done that, the better. And in a client-facing situation where, you know, mistakes are the last thing a law firm wants to do, which I think is, is a huge lesson that I learned both as the mistake maker and then later on as the one who was given the sad news <laughs> and had to sort out the mess. <laughs> but I think that, that, that's a terrible useful lesson. Okay, I just want to ask you a question that came in came into our mailbox, which was on uh, which was on black minority and ethnic women. Um, so, if you look around, uh, say the sector, you know, Claire and I know best, it's senior civil service or politics or that. There, are, there aren't um, corporate. There aren't actually very many role models. The sort of few sort of black minority ethnic women, men who've made it to the top must be inundated with requests to be a mentor to somebody, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's a massive burden. So, what actually sort of do you think uh, could do? Maybe Claire, take this up sort of proactively. I think the civil service now has an action plan around black minority ethnic people getting to the top of the civil service. What actually can people at the top do to make it easier for people to aspire to the top roles and actually? help them get there when there aren't obvious people who can say, well, this is how it was for me, and you know, have the conversations from exactly their experience? I think that's a really good question, because uh, as we were saying before, I mean, there are, there are some conversations where it's, much, you know, it's a lot easier to help somebody understand what they're going through if you can relate back to, to what they're doing. Um, but I think, you know, as you say, there aren't enough, uh, there aren't enough uh, black and ethnic minority people, particularly women, at senior levels. So, you know, what's the what's the next best thing is to is to use, I suppose, particularly kind of coaching type techniques to get people to recognise what they know already. Um, because one of the, you know, one of the things I found in in sort of normal work as well as in mentoring is that mostly people have the answers to questions themselves. But they may not. They either don't realise that, or they don't feel confident owning those answers. So, if you can, you know, where you can say, "Look, I was in a similar situation, and this is what I found," that can be quite helpful because people can go, "Well, I might or might not want to do the same." If you can't, if you haven't got that relevant experience, I mean, a, you've got uh, s certainly things which are very relevant. So, you know, the experience of women is is you know, has many similarities, whether you are a white mm -hmm. woman or a black and ethnic minority woman, so you've got lots of points of contact there, but if there are things that you just don't understand, you have to ask people to tell you about them, and then, you know, and, and try and kind of tease out uh, what people can do for themselves, because I think there is a, you know, you know, we can all do more for ourselves than we realise, and part of the, uh, the, you know, the, the beauty of mentoring is that it's somebody to help you uh, realise that for yourself and feel confident to act on it. But yeah. if everybody mm. needed somebody like that, we'd never have had Patricia Scotland as Attorney General. We'd mm. never have had Brenda Hale in the Supreme Court. We'd never have had Ross Higgins as President of the International Court. And hey, we'd never have had Margaret Thatcher as Prime Minister. Um, you know, you can't always... There's something wrong with the mentality that I can't do this unless somebody who is a nice sort of identical version of me has done it. Sorry. <laughs> Fenina. Really interesting one. Um, people like Vivian Hunt, the managing partner of McKinsey, who, who is uh, African American. Uh, people like Sharon White, of course, and I've just become chief executive of Ofcom. Um, they're in massive demand mm -hmm. um, for these mm -hmm. type, the type of events mm -hmm. that you describe, and, and quite beyond their ability to fulfil all the requests for um, seminars and uh, you know, coaching, mm -hmm. mentoring, speaking on platforms. Mm -hmm. It's a problem, isn't it? Because um, n I agree, nobody, uh, there isn't a prototype of, as it were, me. I quite agree with that. But I think there is something, and in, in one of my books I've written about this, about the power of visibility, actually seeing, uh, envisaging 
uh, being able to look at a person and thinking, actually, they can do this. They're like me. Mm -hmm. I can do this too. That I, I do believe that exists, and our mentees tell us that it is the case that when they look up to organisations and look um, towards Exco or the board, and they don't see very many women, then it is an impediment. So I think the lack of um, black and minority ethnic role models is an issue. I think it's a, an issue. I don't actually have an answer because these people are, in, as I say, in extraordinary demand. Um, I don't have an answer to this. I think it is an issue. I do know that Vince Cable, just before Christmas, launched um, an initiative that is, is slightly akin to the um, Mentoring Foundation and the FTSE 100 Cross Company Mentoring Programme, and that if re-elected, that is the plan, that this will be rolled out to encompass um, members of ethnic minorities quite deliberately. That was Vince Cable's launch, not, not ours, but that might be something that the writer might want to, the writer of the email to your website um, might want to explore. That's, that's very interesting. Let's have some more questions. Uh, just to let you know what I'm doing, you'll have spotted it's 1.30 has passed. Because we started so late, we're going to run till about 1.45. Um, then hopefully there'll be a little bit of time for networking outside. And apologies to any of you who want to ask questions we haven't got time for. So we'll keep it sort of snappy. Yes. Hi, I'm Michelle Wright from the Gatsby Foundation. It's sort of building on the previous question. Um, we work uh, a lot with uh, young people, apprentices, are going into technician roles, particularly in STEM. And I'm wondering what the difference is between role models, particularly for women in engineering, perhaps Claire might have particular opinions on this, and a mentor, especially when you're first starting out, when you're at that apprentice level, you're not maybe going to have access to anybody that you would think of typically as a mentor. So where does the role model come in, and then where does the uh, mentor come in in that relationship? Margaret, you do, you do work with sort of young people. Do you want to just talk a bit about how you sort of get them to sort of see their future in the bright well, ideas trust? Well, well, our ones tend to be ones who come who want to start up businesses on their own, often because um, so, some have been in employment and they decide they want to start up on their own, but a lot haven't been in employment, and actually this is their their way to, to, to be able to mm. pay their way, which, which is, is, and they need a lot of help because it's much easier to know to how, to, how to run a business if you've worked in a business than it is if you've never worked in a business, as some of them are. So that is a bit different from apprenticeships. And what we find that these ones, the kids need, is, is a lot of help um, initially in terms of just, just thinking about the things that they need to think about. Um, and as they go on, a lot of accounting help often, and, and that you know, just because you haven't had an electricity bill this month isn't a good thing necessarily, because <laughs> you, you, you will get one at some point. And you know, it's very, very huh? basic things like that that people don't realise if they haven't had to do that, which is completely different from the you know, higher up the career path. But I think apprentices tend to be um, that there's probably a cohort of apprentices, and just you know, among themselves, they can probably get help. And apprenticeship programmes should have um, built into them, uh, you know, the, the, a sort of mentoring aspect, a coaching aspect, whatever it might be mm. called at, at that level, because they shouldn't just be, you know, sent off with a, with a sort of toolkit and a, you know, an instruction manual and told to come back and you've learned this bit and you've made that widget and then we'll move on to, on to the next thing. So Claire, the civil service introduced this new apprenticeship scheme, yep. hasn't it, which it sort of keeps on touting around on Twitter as the sort of next best thing or the new best thing. So actually, what sort of support do they give their apprentices, or is it a sort of, good, you're an apprentice now, Well, come back in 30 um, years' time and you're a permanent secretary? I mean, how I does mean, that... We've, we've got some apprentices, so we've got apprentices who are, I mean, they are embedded in teams, so they work, um, they work you know, as part of a team mm -hmm. delivering something. So I don't know, it's an interesting question about whether the package in Includes, uh, you know, a formal mentor. But certainly, when I we we had a we had an apprenticeship day for all the apprentices in Department for Transport, and their line managers clearly regard them as themselves as having quite an important role in terms of you know making sure that they they you know they're getting access to the right things. So I don't think, I mean, there's no reason why uh, apprentices just because of you know where they are at the stage they would like shouldn't have mentors. They might want a different type of mentor than some of the people in this room, but. You know, the, the essence of a mentor, which is 
tends to be somebody who is, who is outside your immediate mm -hmm. line management chain, mm -hmm. but who can help you think about some of the broader issues, can give you a different perspective. Uh, you know, you're not instantly <coughs> thinking, well, if I tell this person that, will it turn up in my end year review? I think there's absolutely no reason why we couldn't and shouldn't be making sure that you know, all, appren all apprentices uh, have mentors as well. Okay, we've only got five minutes left, so I'm going to just pick up, let's just harvest questions, and uh, the panel can choose which ones they answer, she said. Um, hopefully they'll answer all of them. So we've got a couple down here. Anyone else in a last call for comments or whatever? No? Yes. Okay, I've got a question, I think probably an ending towards what Mar Ma where Margaret's been coming from, but I feel like I've got to where I have in my career so far through a thing of hard work and serendip serendipity. And it feels like I'm not, I'm not, not had a mentor because I've been in the private sector, I've just moved over into the public sector. I could never have anticipated the job I'm in at the moment. Um, it was the vision of my boss who saw me apply to another role and gave me this one instead. And I guess it's just, what do you think a mentor could have offered, given I've never really had a long-term goal? I've always just been, my goal has been to do really well at what I'm doing at the moment and then figure out what next when I get bored. So you couldn't have filled out Panina's form, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever, I don't know. Anyway, yes, okay, yes, Sukhvinder. Yes, hi, Sukhvinder. Um, this is something I noticed when I was on the board of Seven Trent Water and I was working with a number of the senior women then there trying to help them to step up. And actually... Noticing it even more now, I, I, I continue to mentor a number of, of senior women across different uh, sectors. And what I'm finding is that there are quite a growing number of women who are choosing to take a sideways uh, move. And they say that they're, going, that they're getting more learning, uh, growing more, actually getting more challenge from that, uh, rather than continuing that upward trajectory. And I... And I'm wondering whether this is something to be celebrated or commiserated. I mean, what's, what sort of advice would you give to a woman who feels that she has to choose between, you know, continuing to push upwards or actually finding more enjoyment uh, working uh, sideways? Okay, any sort of final reflection? We'll do the panel in this order. So, Panina, do you want to, do you want to kick off with a person whose career is a random walk, but a satisfying random walk? and the person who's wondering whether to go upwards or crossways or whatever and should basically, is the going crossways a bit of sort of opting out and giving up, should the mentor be persuading them to look a bit upwards? Okay, perhaps I could um, focus on the, the issues you just raised. Um, mentoring is essentially about human development and growth. And people develop in different directions, sometimes um, in quite unexpected ways to what they might earlier on in their career have anticipated. And there isn't, you know, there isn't somebody telling you what to do. It's helping people find their path and be fulfilled and fulfill their potential, however, however they describe that. Um, so that's, that's essentially my answer, that, that mentoring is a human development activity. Um, it's not, you know, it's not an organisation or a company or a government saying, you know, this is, this is what it should be like. It's, in my view, helping people to actually reach their optimum level of achievement. So, and to be happy with that life that they've created for themselves, they have but one. And so if, if a woman or a man uh, is happy in role, would like to take a sideways move and not look for that upper tra trajectory, if I can say it, trajectory, that's a good word, isn't it? Um, that's absolutely fine. Um, that's absolutely fine. And again, I go back to my point that people develop at different times. Sometimes people sort of have their foot hard on the accelerator and want to get through some grades or some roles or to have different experience or to go and work in the Hong Kong office, whatever it might be, that's fine. Other times they actually want to relax the foot off the accelerator a bit. That's equally legitimate. Um, so there's a huge amount of personal volition in this and, and I think the best mentors are helping people find their path, their path, not my path or anybody else's path, their path. And if that's a sideways move, that's absolutely fine or foot off the accelerator entirely, that's absolutely fine. 
So, Claire, do you always have a cunning plan um, that you're going to be DG Rail? <laughs> Funnily enough, no. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great. It's absolutely fascinating. I think if I try and pick up both of those very quickly, I think the, you know, one thing that's really important to say is you don't have to have a mentor. You don't have to want a mentor. I think the thing about a mentor is if there comes a moment when you want to, uh, kind of reach out, mm. you want different a different perspective, that's the moment to go ask for a mentor. If you don't feel the need for one, then you probably don't have the need for one. And, and one of the issues is people saying, I think you should have a mentor, which tends <laughs> to mean, I think I want you to be doing something different. Uh, so, <laughs> so think about, you know, do you want a mentor for you, or have you been told? And if you've been told, is that because somebody is shying away from giving you a different message? But I think you know, the moment when you want a mentor will occur to you. It'll be when you want to go ask. And, but I think the, the, the idea of, of the personal board, the people who give you why, advice is actually is, is actually very important and I think on the point about people going sideways and one of the things I, I constantly say to people who I'm mentoring is it's all about choices uh, and the choices that you might make aren't the same choices that I might make so I can describe to people the series of choices I made about you know particularly as my children were small and growing up I made particular choices at particular times and they were valid for a period and when they stopped being valid then I made some other choices, and the most important thing was they were my choices, uh, and when they, when they felt like the wrong choices, I changed them, but I changed them you know, on the whole, because you know, if you've got ch choices to do with having children mm. growing up, you've also got a family, so I made them in conjunction with my family. But that sense of you know, what works mm. for me may not work for you, and in any case, what works for you now may not work for you in a short time. So I think so I think from that point of view, it's fine. I do, you know, I think I could wax for hours on, is it right that we are operating in a, in a society, in a workplace where actually a lot of women do feel that, uh, you know, there is this choice to be made, that mm. it isn't necessarily a full, you know, the workplace is not as fulfilling as it might be uh, because of the prevailing culture and all of that. I think that's, you know, that will be another fascinating topic for another day. And Margaret, final word. Well, I feel like the third judge in the Court of Appeal just says, I agree. <laughs> Has he been paying attention at all? But I think, yes, everybody doesn't need a mentor, and you may well have found the right path for you without it. Although it sounds to me like the person who suggested that you do this job rather than that job may have been doing a sort of mentor role um, unofficially. And I, I think the, the, the opting out, I mean, I think it's great that there are all these other opportunities now. I mean, everybody cannot be the chief executive, can they? Because the thing is not going to work that way. And there's all sorts of different roles. And it's a question for you know what makes someone feel happy and fulfilled. And some people can't conceive of not actually getting to the top of what they're doing. And there's plenty of others who, who fortunately don't want to to do that and have a different style and a different approach and want more time to do other things and so on and, and and it's great that i mean in the law in particular where it used to be that everybody had to sort of you know and there's now a whole raft of professional support lawyers who who, who do the job of keeping everybody up to date with the law it's much more interesting than having to deal with clients but but it, it's uh, it, it's it's you know it, it doesn't have the same time pressures and so on but it's a perfectly valid career move and it's it's good for everybody that there are those roles and 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 then you can change back to doing something different if you want to so as long as you haven't found yourself in what you thought was a side road and turns out to be a cul-de-sac you know that that's what matters I think the government legal service wouldn't exist without lots and lots of very high-powered women lawyers deciding actually they don't work 23 hours a day in city firms or whatever. Well, I just think it's interesting and uh, whatever. Uh, it's a slight side issue. I want to do two things. First of all, I want to thank Ernst and Young for their sponsorship of this event. This has actually been the last of this Women Leaders series that we've worked with our colleagues at Ernst and Young on. Go back and have a look at some of the previous excellent events earlier in the series. But I'm absolutely delighted to announce there is a new series of IFG and uh, some young women leaders, absolutely seamless transition. And on the 24th of March, we're going to have the first in our next series, which is going to be uh, entitled Women, Media and the Election. Uh, the subtitle was going to be, is it better to be ignored or patronised? Uh, <laughs> but we're not actually going to put that on the invitation. Uh, but that will be a bit of the sub-theme in the light of the pink bus, etc. Uh, so anyway, so with some sort of journalists, etc., etc. And then we're going to be developing the rest of the series over the rest of the year. We've got some very interesting and fun ideas in mind. If you've got any great thoughts, though, 
uh, do come and have a word with me at IFG or Gemma Williams from Ernst Young, who's there. Um, second, uh, we've got some networking time built in. That's a bit curtailed. Uh, if there's anyone who actually is another coach or mentor who might want to be available to talk to people and they'd like to make themselves known, if people want to mingle, there'll be coffee outside, I hope. Yes, Lauren confirms there'll be coffee outside. So we can't control the president of Mexico, but we can control the availability <laughs> of coffee. So do stay and have a quick cup of coffee. And as I said, very many apologies to you who were trapped uh, there. But finally, could I just thank our absolutely terrific panel today for sharing all those insights and I think giving some really, really interesting tips, thoughts, and very supportive comments. So thank you, Margaret, Claire, and Panina. Thank you.